Okay, I'm Tom Duxbury and I'm the Heritage Skills Trainer and Assessor for the TOWIE Centre and today we're going to be looking at some building defects. So we're walking around Carmarthen, Carmarthen Town, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at defects that affect the fabric of a building. So we're not really looking at cosmetic, we're not looking at things that might just affect the aesthetics of the building, we're looking at things that are actually going to affect the fabric that will cause predominantly damp issues or maybe structural issues. Hopefully we don't find any of those, although we may. But what we're going to be looking at is how you will do a survey of a basic survey of a building. And we always start from the top. We always start from the chimneys, the roofs, the gutters, coming down windows and doors down to ground level. We're always going to find the same defects. Most buildings suffer from rainwater. We're in West Wales, we're in one of the wettest parts of the UK and recently we've had severe flooding but it's rainwater damage that is the predominant cause for defects in the buildings and fabric failure. So what we're going to look at is if we just look across the road, start from the roof, start from the chimneys and you can see these aren't in bad condition. There's some moss, there's a few bits of growth on the chimneys and on the slates but they're not in bad nick. There's a swan neck gutter where you can see some things growing out of it. Now those are going to grow bigger. The root structure is going to actually impact on the fabric and eventually that will cause more harm. So it's something that needs attention. What I will say as well is we talk about repair and maintenance and actually that's the title of one of these uh, level three courses. But repairs can be what required after poor maintenance and that gutter up there is an instance where maintenance is what's needed. Regular maintenance, proactive maintenance that's scheduled will always be the best option. Reactive, which usually requires more repairs, may not be the best option. It could be more costly, take more time and just regular maintaining your building is always the best way. Now here we have an example of a classic failure of rainwater goods. We've got a cast iron rectangular historic rainwater goods which will be very classic in a lot of towns and the joints have failed. You can clearly see where the water's leaking out of the downpipe at a joint and that moisture is running behind the actual iron it's going into the masonry there's only one place that water is going to go and that's internally we're not going inside any of these buildings today but i will guarantee there will be damp issues within that building behind that downpipe now this building that we're looking at is not necessarily traditional in the sense of a solid wall building built of stone maybe of brick we're looking at something that's more modern but it's still suffering from the same faults. It's got the same defects on that building. And what you can see is things growing. Now, we will look at all of those um, um, leaves and things blocking gutters, but this has actually got the ubiquitous buddleia growing out of it. Now, buddleia is a very fast growing plant shrub, which the roots will go into the masonry and cause further damage. So the amount of greenery that we see actually showing on the outside there are as many roots actually within the masonry of this building and they're eating away at the mortar at the lime and they're going to be causing damage they'll also be causing conduits for water so when we look at this building those there's ferns and the buddleia they didn't grow in a week they've been there for probably months if not years and again, they are not going to get any better on their own. And you can clearly see the damage to the masonry. You can see spalling 
of the rend, you can see spalling of the stonework. And that building is getting wetter and wetter. It's also therefore getting colder. Because once the walls are wet, they suck the heat out of a building. Now this is an industrial building, it's a retail unit. But the actual consequences are the same. It doesn't matter what the use of a building is. So that is a serious case of lack of maintenance. And it looks neglected. It is neglected. And again, it is not going to get any better. Oh, yeah. yes. So we always start from the top, as I think I've already mentioned. And it's an obvious process. We start at the top of the building, looking predominantly at chimneys. If anybody doesn't know me, I'm a fan of chimneys. I don't like them being taken out. But what we're going to look at here is a chimney that's it's in brick and it's in reasonably good condition. But when you look at the clay chimney pot, it's acting like a flower pot. It's got something growing out of it. That's been there for a while and it's blocking that chimney. Whether the chimney's used or not is irrelevant. Chimneys act as a passive ventilation system. They're drying out those buildings. So having that blocked does several things. It's making the rooms damper inside, but also it's now allowing rainwater to accumulate and will actually come down that chimney. It is not going to get any better. It is going to get damper and worse. That is a very simple maintenance issue. If left, that could grow. The roots could grow. It could grow into the masonry. It could go into the flaunching. We could end up looking at something much bigger as a project, costing several thousand pounds instead of a few hundred. So maintenance isn't just because it makes the building look nice, it makes the building operate properly, it works as it was intended, and in the long term it saves money. Cost and time. So maintenance is the major issue that we have with all our traditional buildings and modern buildings. So another instance of looking at the downpipes, the rainwater goods, and general failure of a building what we've got here is a, a classic frontage of a retail shop. It is a bank and it's probably been a bank for a long time. But when you start looking closely, you don't have to look that closely. You will see the down pipes, they are failing. The joints are failing. There's lots of growth coming out of them. Wherever you see greenery, whether it's moss, verdigris, or actual plants growing, they're feeding off moisture. And you can clearly see a joint has failed on the downpipe and you've got further evidence of water running down the wall. We've also got on this building, we've also got there's a, a band mould just below the top floor windows. And you can see there are plants growing out of that as well. Again, this is just a maintenance issue. But what's happened is you can clearly see that water's got behind the render. It's got nowhere to get out. The sand and cement render is impervious or nearly impervious and it is holding back the water on this building. So you're having blown render. That just tells you that that wall now is soaking wet. And this is gonna be a repetitive theme that that water is going to cause damage internally. That water going inside that building, it could damage ceilings, it could damage skirting boards and fittings, but it could also damage joist ends, timber lintels. Once you get to that stage, we're looking at rot, wet rot, possibly even dry rot. You're now looking possibly at whole floors collapsing. You're looking at ornate plaster ceilings. This building, I haven't been in there, but I suspect there are ornate plaster ceilings in there somewhere. They are not things that are easily repaired. So again, what could be a few hundred pounds of maintenance could end up as thousands of pounds of restoration work. The other thing we need to look at is, is this a listed building? Because if it is, just these aspects of repair and maintenance, they're like for like repairs. They don't need permission. We can just carry them out as long as we use the appropriate materials. Could argue that these are already the inappropriate materials, but we can still carry on using the sand and cement and the plastic rainwater goods. However, if any further damage does take place, if it does go into joist ends and we start losing floors or having to replace windows, having to replace ceilings. You're going to need listed building consent for those if this was a listed building. 
So you've now got a consent issue, you need permission, and you've got time for that to happen. So the actual decay, the moisture is not going to go away, it's gonna keep getting in there, and the costs are going to spiral. Another issue with a building like this is access. We're on a pedestrian footpath. It is a thoroughfare, although at the moment it's closed. But if you were to put a scaffold up there, if you're going to have a scaffold up, it would have to still allow for pedestrian access. It could only be there for one or two days. It could be done over a weekend, a bank holiday, maybe even just in an evening in the summer. If then we start looking at scaffolding this building entirely, you might have to close the road. The expense is spiralling. The costs are going, pardon the pun, through the roof. So this building needs attention and it should have been done in the appropriate weather. Now we're in the winter, you probably don't want to be doing that type of work now. One advantage though, is that you can see the failure of the rainwater goods. You can watch the water coming out of the gutters and the downpipes, but that is not going to get any better. You're gonna hear me saying that endlessly today. Instead of just picking on defects and inappropriate materials, poor workmanship, we need to look also at what's done correctly, or, or maybe not done well, but done better than average. Now what we've got on this roof here is we've got a brick chimney with clay pots that have been capped with cowls. Now they may be gas cowls, but they may not be. And they've got holes in them for ventilation. So although the chimney isn't in use with a, an open fire or uh, anything burning fuel, it's actually got ventilation still going through that chimney. So that's well done. Adjacent to it is a much bigger, probably a stone chimney. Well, that is a guess. Now that has been rendered and capped off. It's, yes, it's got some things growing in it, but they've put an air brick in. And I'm suspecting it's not the only one. So once again, they're allowing that airflow to go through your chimney flue to keep it dry. It reduces the risk of moisture, it reduces condensation in the flue, and it does act as a passive ventilation system. So well done, but again, it still needs a bit of maintenance. As we're coming down the building, we've got to the gutters. We've come down the chimney and looked at the roofs, and we're now looking at the guttering. Now the guttering in front of me here, it's more like a roof garden. It's got grass, it's full of grass that's growing there. It's living off rubbish, detritus, leaves, uh, pigeon droppings that have come from above. But again, that didn't happen overnight. That grass has been growing there for a while. I would tempt it to say years. It's blocked the gutter. That gutter is leaking along its whole length. And you can see, when you actually look at it, you look at the downpipe adjacent to it, you can see that all of these rainwater goods on these buildings are not performing very well. These are all buildings that are commercial use. The shops and retail on the ground floor. They may be residential above, but they're gonna be tenanted. There's gonna be landlords looking after these buildings. So there's probably not the onus on the tenants to do any repair and maintenance. And the landlords, they may be distant landlords, they may not be local. They may not even be aware that there are these defects and faults with their buildings. We'll look at that later when we actually look at domestic properties and compare and contrast a little bit. But you can see on this whole building, the painted brickwork. It's not painted in a pervious, permeable paint. It's starting to peel. The bricks behind are wet. It's not being allowed to dry out. The growth around all the downpipes is prominent. It looks like it's neglected. It is neglected, but it wouldn't take that much to put it right. It wouldn't take that much to actually get this building performing well. And long term, that is the only way to do it, is maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Another issue with um, commercial buildings and retail especially is when they're in shopping areas and on high streets, is that the road surfaces and the pavements tend to get higher and higher, sometimes by quite a lot. You know, 500 millimetres, even though I've known up to 1200 millimetres higher than they were, I'll say originally when the shops or the buildings were first built. 
Now this isn't the case here, but what we have got is we've got a, a modern hard paving up against the shop front. And what you'll see is it's, because this ground isn't that permeable, it gets a lot of lying water and it gets a lot of splash back onto the shop fronts. So you'll see a lot more decay. It may not affect the fabric of the shop that much. The stall riser, the bit below the windows, that may survive and it might just need a little bit of repair and maintenance. But if these have got cellars, what you quite often see is an erosion and decay happening where the pavement abuts the walls. And you can see that on this instance where the actual, there are gaps forming below the render and below the walls and some of the timber on the pilasters is starting to rot. These need addressing, very simple to do, not that expensive, and they would actually preserve the building. If there were cellars under here, which I don't think these have, but if there were cellars, they will be now acting as conduits. The water will be literally running down these walls, running between the gap of the wall and the pavement and filling the basement with dampness. As we started off, or I started off telling you about defects and repair and maintenance, and I was saying that defects are things which will cause harm to the building. Now, usually a broken pane of glass, I wouldn't classify as a defect. However, if it's not attended to, there are other elements involved. It is going to allow rain to penetrate. You could get pigeons, jackdaws, vermin getting into your building. There's also vandalism and theft, which can, in the long term, cause defects, decay, damage to your building. And what we've got here is just some broken panes of glass. But what you will notice or may notice is that behind them there are some railings. This was a post office. I think it was a bank before it was a post office. But this building had to be secure. So it's not going to get vandalism beyond that point. But it's not going to do it any good either. What we're going to go and have a look at now is something that you don't see that often. But something which some people might think is not very nice. And we've looked at rainwater goods, we've looked at downpipes, but you might want to pan onto the floor. It's not just rainwater we're looking at. What we're looking at there is a defect or a failure of a soil and vent pipe. Um, we could call it a poo pipe. That's what people I know have occasionally called these. It's actually ventilating and servicing toilets. So maybe we want to consider what we've just walked through a little bit more. But this is a cast iron pipe and you can clearly see as it goes up, it's been joined with plastic and this has been leaking for a very long time. The lime scale has built up on the plastic and it's actually staining the masonry. But it's soaking in. Again, this is a sand and cement render on this wall and it is soaking in behind it. It's not very pleasant. And again, it's probably something that would be very, very easily fixed. There's leaks, there's joints that need attention. This has been going on for years and it's not the most pleasant environment to be in at the moment. Once again, working down the building, we've come below the eaves, we've come below the roof line, and we're now looking at the actual facade of a building. And well, what we've got here is almost certainly this was a solid wall building, probably stone, maybe brick, but it's been rendered in sand and cement. And the issue with sand and cement is that because it's so brittle and hard, it won't stop the building moving. These buildings were built with minimal foundations. Uh, they probably are built in lime entirely. So they move, they move with the moisture level in the ground. They heave when it's wet and they actually crack and shrink and move and distort when the summer comes along and the ground dries out. That's what these buildings do. We can't stop it. 
but the sand and cement render, which is brittle and hard, can't accommodate that movement, so it cracks. Of itself, that's not an issue. It might not look very nice, but the problem is that the water gets in behind it, then can't get out. So we end up with lots of small cracks, map cracking, which is you get that crazing of cracks. And we will see some of those where we can actually look at the cracks and the water coming out. But on this building, the cracks are bigger than that. The cracks in the render are actually following cracks in the masonry that's behind. And some of these cracks, they will always go from a weak point. So they will go from corners of windows, corners of door openings, and you can actually track the crack to its widest point, which is the end away from where the fault is usually happening. But when they actually follow very specific lines, horizontal lines, you might have rotten timber behind, rotten lintels, you might have wall plates that are rotting, or you might have subsidence caused in some of the party walls. Once you've got that, you can actually look at those cracks and if they're let's say more than five or ten millimeters wide you have got a structural problem we can actually map them we can record them you actually track the actual movement we use telltales or we just measure them and if they get excessive they can be a sign of something more serious now what we've got on this building here is two or three horizontal cracks going between the windows and there's one across from the doorway. They look like they are following certain lines of masonry and they are probably a sign of something significant going on. This is now the instance where you get a professional. Uh, you need a structural surveyor to look at these. This is not something that can just be attended to by your most ordinary surveyors or your builder. This needs to have further investigation by a specialist. So we, here we have, we're in um, the actual Carmarthen Square here in front of the Guildhall, where we're looking at a corner building, which is another example of good maintenance. It's solid brickwork, very soft red bricks with Georgian style sliding sashes, and it's in very, very good condition. It's a very old facade and it may have been repointed in sand and cement, but without an analysis or going out picking holes in the wall, I can't tell. But it looks and appears to be working well. It hasn't got excessive dampness. Everything appears to be in good order. Good maintenance. Now what we have here is a, a multitude of sins. We've got a, a very old stone building in Carmarthen as we're coming down going towards the quay and the actual masonry itself was built in lime and you, if you look closely you can actually see the sandstone that it was constructed from but you can see the paint is peeling off there's bits of sand and cement pointing that have been placed patched over and they're all peeling off as well So far we've been pretty much looking at uh, commercial properties, at retail outlets with rooms or flats above that may be residences or may not, but they will be tenanted in some shape or form. And generally the roofs, chimneys, rainwater goods have not been in that good condition. We're now in a different street where these are all residential. There's a few shops on the ground floor, but predominantly residential. And Yes, they are only two-storey buildings, but the chimneys, the roofs, the flashings, the rainwater goods, the steps in the buildings, because there aren't any parapets, are all in much better condition. Now, this may be private owners who've got a more of a vested interest. And that's probably the message today, isn't it? That if you own your property, it's the highest value thing you will ever own. Why would you let it decay? It's not like a car that you're going to chop and change and get a new one. Most of our buildings are already built. Traditional buildings in Wales make up at least a third of our buildings. So we need to look after them and they are worth a lot of money. However, 
there is one building opposite where I'm standing and you can quite clearly see the wall is soaking wet and it doesn't take a scientist to notice there is a piece of the cast iron guttering missing. Again, quite a straightforward repair. It's a standard section of gutter or even to replace the whole gutter itself would immediately prevent the problems. And one of the problems with these buildings is they've got flush eaves. There is no overhang. So once the water comes off those slates, it's into the render, it's into the masonry. And that is going to be a very damp building inside. And you'll usually find it at low level. Um, you might find it on chimneys, on new built chimneys, is a white staining. Um, it looks like lime, but it isn't. And what that staining is, it's hygroscopic salts. Now in the instance we're looking at here, it's actually, there's groundwater behind because it's a retaining wall. But it's not the groundwater that is causing the actual staining on the brickwork. Now these are new walls, they've been rebuilt, but the aggregate in the mortar contained too much salt, so the sand had too much salt in it. It looks unpleasant, doesn't look particularly nice. Now in this instance, with sand and cement, it doesn't affect it. But if we were using a lime mortar, or if this was internal, and we were going to render it with a lime plaster, these salts can attack lime. They can have a detrimental effect on all lime mortars and lime plasters. And literally, it's just because there's too much salt in the aggregate that was used. So here we have another look at some masonry, some uh, painted and rendered gable end, pine end to us. And it's had many, many treatments to it. It's a stone wall, you can clearly see the stone masonry at ground floor level. But it's had sand and cement render on it, impervious masonry paint, all of which is failing. And wherever you see that starting to fail and come off and delaminate or peel or bubble, that's water trapped behind. And yet a lot of people still believe that that has been put there to keep their building dry. It's making it more damp. But then if we look at the plinth, we look at this rendered plinth, it's on the slope of the ground and it's roughly a metre high at one end. And you can see the map cracking. You can clearly see those cracks in that cement render. That has been put there to actually prevent damp and moisture coming in at that level. And what it's actually doing is trapping it in place. Moisture is still getting in above it and still coming up from the ground behind it and it cannot get out. There's one section below the window which is darker and that's where it's the wettest. So that's what the whole thing would have looked like when it was raining. Now it's drying, those map cracks where you can see them, they're highlighted and that's the moisture trying to get out. And I emphasize trying to get out. That moisture is trapped. That intervention has done the exact opposite of what it was intended to do, which is making the wall wetter. So also it's making the wall colder, which costs more to heat. This isn't a repair and maintenance, this is a rectification of inappropriate work. We've looked at the fabric of the building from the chimneys down through the roof, the rainwater goods, the masonry, the rendering, the walls. What we're going to look at now is joinery. And we've got some very nice Georgian semicircular headed sliding sash windows. Uh, very well proportioned and there's a whole terrace of these here. Now the first one, the paint's peeling off, it's in need of some attention. Just from a casual inspection, it doesn't appear to have any particularly rotten elements to it, but it is at that point, if it's left alone, moisture will get behind the putty, behind the timber, and you will end up with rotten sections that will need replacing. The second window, which is on the same building, has already got to that point. The meeting rail, bottom rail, and part of the frame you can clearly see where the, the timber has got wet rot. Can't be dry rot because this is external. And they are going to need replacing by repairs. I will say again, if this is a listed building and that's a like for like repair, it doesn't need permission, but they should be purely like for like repairs. 
But the question then is who's going to do it? This is not your run of the mill carpenter's work. This is specialist conservation, restoration, joinery. So getting the right person in, it's not cheap, I'm not gonna pretend that, but these are fully repairable with retention of 90, 95% of what's existing. But as I say, the first window, that's just a little bit of maintenance, some paint. The second one, that's where you've got. If that isn't attended to, you could end up having to replace sashes and whole portions of the frame. Not just looking at the buildings and the structures, especially if we're considering protected buildings, listed buildings, because they can be other things than the actual the building itself. They can be walls, boundary walls, railings. What we've got here is a set of iron railings which are associated with this guild hall in Carmarthen and they've obviously been damaged. But they, the base of this is cast and I think the rest is wrought iron or cast iron. The repair for this is not something that can just be done by a regular fabricator. This is specialist work. So again, it's looking at who can do these repairs correctly. They could be done, this could be replicated in timber, but it wouldn't last very long. They could be replaced new, but this is a listed building, and this is part of this listed building. So getting specialist people, their advice, and specialist people to actually carry out the work, because otherwise you can be doing the wrong thing, could be a criminal offence as well as causing harm to a building.